We're still on with the breakfast and plus TV Africa is time for off the press. Now, usually we take uh, time to look through the pages, the front pages to be precise of a national dailies. And then we have a guest join to uh, make sense of some of the headlines. Chris Kende Wandu joins us this morning. I mean, he's uh, joining us for the first time in 2023. Chris, it's good to have you join us. Good morning and Happy New Year. I Happy New Year, Mesia. Happy New Year to all our viewers across the globe. I hope you had a wonderful, you know, holiday and celebration. I did, and I can see that glowing on your face too. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, let's quickly start off with the Nation newspaper. The Nation says, letter, uh, Obasanjo is jealous, frustrated, says presidency. I mean, you know how uh, the Nation, you know, sometimes put out their, the headlines, quite interesting. Underneath, WK ex-president's endorsement of OB, a stain on Atiku. Of course. Uh, there will be a lot of tongues that would wag. And backing for a la Labour presidential candidate, inconsequential. I'm sure you want to find out who is saying all of that. Now, please confirm transfer of men from Aja Division uh, following the death and the killing of uh, Bola, Bola Lear, uh Rahman. Uh, I think the CP had thought that he should transfer you know, all of the men from Aja Division. But that, that doesn't solve the problem. Uh, that's not the point. I think that Nigerians are asking for a total reform, you know, of the system. Uh, Nigerians or Nigeria raises concern over the increasing COVID-19 cases in China. So uh, just when we have gotten to a point where we say, oh, uh, we're relaxing all of the protocols, no more uh, face masks. It's not nice. It's, necess it's very compulsory. You have to wear it if you want to wear it for other reasons, but uh, you're not under any obligation to wear that. Funeral rites begin for Pele, of course, uh, that legend that died, football legend. One third of the world may slip into recession in 2023. IMF is warning. And God help us that we're not part of, you know, one of this economy that will slip into recession. Uh -huh. Tunibu insists patrol subsidy must go. But... A lot of economic experts and even ordinary Nigerians have said uh, it's fine to say <clears throat> subsidy should go, but we need also need to pay attention to you know the state of our refineries. We need to stop uh, the whole you know process of having to import our crude because we lack or we have decided not to refine our crude, not because we don't have the capacity, but there's no willpower to do all of that. Now, on the punch is what we're looking at now. We turn our attention to the punch. The punch says, anti-Buhari letter, presidency lambas, uh, former president Olusegun Obasanjo says, ex-president's government corrupts. Obasanjo sold $3.2 billion Al's con, other assets for peanuts and removed government's uh, governors arbitrarily. Ex-president deceived Southeast with second Niger Bridge. Buhari completed it. <laughs> uh, you also have, you know, another writer saying, a former president, a hypocrite, plotting third term, interim uh, government through OB, APC and PDP quoted to say. I mean, that's so interesting. But like I, I stated earlier on during our top trending, I think this is natural. External reserve fell by $3.4 billion in 2022. This is according to reports. Mobile subscription increased by 23 million, now 218 million, which also, uh, you know, is in connection with the population of Nigeria. I mean, according to recent statistics, you need to know that numbers have increased. Power generation crashes by 990 uh, megawatts and Gensco lost 1.8 trillion naira. That is a lot. National Assembly budget 850 million for failed constitution amendment. Now, it feels like every other time we're not able to continue because uh, I don't think the Ninth Assembly, of course, very eminent uh, that they won't be able, you know, to I'll go ahead with the constitutional process. And so there needs to be a transfer. And that's why there's a budget for it. Uh, again, on the punch newspaper, you find a JDPO transfer 
transferred as please redeployed corps. Uh, that's what you find there. G5 governors adamant set for Mackenzie's campaign. <laughs> Adeleke fumes as Oyetola insists tribunal will sack governor. These are some of the headlines you find this morning on The Nation. Now we have the leadership that's been made available by a paper vendor. Unsettled by Obasanjo's letter, presidency hits back. Now, have you ever thought about this? What if the support, you know, was on the other side it was the other way the table had turned and then the you know former president was supporting uh the apc or probably supporting you know the pdp would there be sounding this way says ex-president represent dark days of nigeria's democracy can't stand a better leader campaign council trades words or with content of letter opposition g3 over sign of victory that's what uh Tinibu is saying okay nobody can stop election in southeast ipop declares ex emo governor escapes as gunmen kill for please orderlies fct native six integration of 858 communities and just before we move away from the leadership now there's also uh you know a convoy attack where tambo vows to bring perpetrators to book and FIRS unveils instant tax clearance certificate. Lucky Port opens stocks with liquid uh, bog terminals for phase two development. Now, I did not frustrate zoning of PDP tickets to south. That's what Wiki is saying. And some people think that, you know, you're happy to be here this, you know, in the Labour Party because uh, the likes of Atiku frustrated him out of the party. Uh, we, we, we turn attention now to the Daily Sun newspaper. Quickly on the Daily Sun, uh, quite different but almost similar with some of the headlines on other papers this morning. Underage voters, parents, rigs, arrests. How did we even get to a point where we're even saying there will be a system? I mean, the consideration, the thoughts that underage would vote. So we will get to a point where we don't arrest them. It just tells a lot about, you know, the system and the entire process. Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs set standards for elections. That's what you find on the Daily Sun newspaper. And uh, Obi's endorsement, presidency accuses former President Olushegun Obasanj of always attacking Buhari out of frustration. So they are saying he's an angry bird. Fresh survey puts Obi ahead of Atiku and Tinubu. Uh, well, that's a survey. Uh, you know the we're talking about people going out to cast their votes. A lot of persons have not gotten their PVCs, and it's important that uh, they should be factored in. Okay? Wiki Tons Atiku accuses ex vice president of frustrating zoning and PDP. And just before we move away, Mobolan lays killing in uh, Lagos CP redeploys the uh, police officers in the station. No respite for motorist consumers as fuel scarcity persists. Transport fare keeps increasing. Another says, please in gun battle with hoodlums and rescue three kidnapped victims in Delta. Quite commendable uh, talking about rescue mission of three kidnapped victims in Delta. Well, cholera kills eight in Eboi. Gunmen attack ex emo governors. Uh, convoy and killed for security aids. These are some of the headlines you find this morning on the Daily Sun. Chris, many thanks for joining us. Thank you once again for having me. I, I like us to start off with uh, the Nation newspaper, uh, the caption about a former president's jealousy and the fact that he's frustrated, and that's the reason why you know he's probably endorsing uh, Peter Obi. This is what the president is saying. There are too many reactions, uh, you know, following this endorsement. Yeah, that's just as rightly said. Uh, what would have happened if uh, Abbasanjo had uh, endorsed the candidature of uh, Ashura Jubala Metinubu, the candidate of the APC? Uh, would they have come out to uh, to rant the way they did? I don't think they will flex. Uh, one thing you can take away from Los Angeles is that right from um, time in my local balance, what was the right from Imo River? Uh, that's uh, <laughs> from time in the area. It has been very consistent in when it comes to issue of Let's take uh, our 
our viewers back to as far back as 1979 when he was the military head of state and um, we had the handover to the civilian government uh, by his government. Uh, the, uh, some people believe that uh, Abbas Sanjo was softly, softly supported the candidature of the uh, National Party of Nigeria, the MP, uh, the person of the state, Shehu Shagari. And um, Shehu Shagari defeated the likes of uh, Obafemi Awolowo, the uh, Nambi Azikiwe of the MP. Uh, MPP, Wazir Ibrahim, Ibrahim, GMP, and the Moon, and the That was in 1969. Before uh, that, the uh, Moon was toppled by uh, the Muhammad Bari government in um, 1983 or thereabouts. Then, fast track, in 1999, he came back as civilian president and he was elected twice. While he was leaving office, he endorsed the candidature of uh, late Yaradua. Uh, in fact, during that election, before that uh, primaries of uh, PDP, uh, it, most people think that the former governor of, um, of uh, River State, uh, Peter Dili, was going to be the candidate for of the PDP then, and uh, until uh, and Job put the drug off him and uh, decided to endorse um, uh, and Yaradu was just like that was sick. Um, later on, uh, of course, he had no choice when uh, Yaradu died. Um, uh, Jonathan uh, took over. And in 2015, this same um, person, instead of supporting Jonathan, don't forget that at a point uh, towards the end of that thing, you know, fell out with Gulo Jonathan. And his policies and it was consistent. He consistently uh, was uh, against that government. That was the time of his letter writing. Then he decided to become a publisher and writer of letters. And he endorsed this very president in 2015. And um, not uh, everybody, uh, even those in government, uh, were shocked by his uh, uh, endorsement because he was a member of the PDP. Then. Uh, it was at that point that he said he is no longer a, a member of any political party that he wants to become a statesman, but he endorsed. And I remember this same uh, government, uh, APC then and opposition party, and uh, and uh, uh, Paula Ahmed Chilubun visiting him in uh, Abelkuta uh, to seek an endorsement, which he did. But in 2019, he fell out with Kwari again and endorsed Atiku Abubakar. So that has been the trajectory of. Um, so you can't take away that from him. It is his right as a Nigerian to endorse anybody. Uh, the issue is that can in his endorsement they could put any weight and they be able to swear the feelings of Nigerians to swear vote for the candidate of his choice. That is also I think that the government should just focus on the message and not the message that they continue attack on Obasan just for making his free choice. It's just um, on presidential for me, and uh, I think um, the presidency through the spokesperson, uh, spokespersons of the presidency, just focus on the message. Uh, do you think that all of this endorsement? I mean, we've had, uh, you know, the conversations with the G five governors and their intention whether or not to endorse, you know, certain uh, presidential candidate ahead of the elections in February. Um, does he? Is, is does he? you know, is he of any importance, especially when we know that, you know, you are entitled to just one vote. So all of these governors will just have to cast just one vote, not two, not three. So I'd like to share your thoughts. This pattern of endorsement in our democracy, does it have any significance? Does he, is he worthy of um, our conversation? Endorsement is a universal um, political process across the globe, not just Nigeria. Remember, even the United States of America, you see, when Obama wanted to, there's all certain celebrities who pictures, um, endorsed them before they met. Even uh, Biden, including the uh, former uh, president, the one that, uh, that uh, Biden took over. Um, so it is not new. Um, yes, it has some level of influence. Yes. That has not been measured in the intrusive aspect. I'm yet to see a survey that was that's suggest the fact that because somebody was endorsed by certain 
um, because of that, he was going to. Win. Yes, they have one vote, but some of them also have some influence. They can also influence some people to go uh, the other way. Um, it's just like uh, in my home, if I decide to vote for a, a particular candidate, and um, that is it. I have, um, I have a way and manner that I can. I can go ask my wife to say, if I'm going to vote for this particular party, you must follow me and vote for that. But the fact is that in as much as Kwasa, like, if we get to the polling booth, she's going to go into the polling booth alone. So I wouldn't even know whether she listened to me or not. So those are the issues as it were. But um, endorsement is nothing new. And how that is going to influence the election, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know. But there have been instances where there have been a lot of endorsement, and at the end of it, they just see, realize that um, the candidates, some of these people, it used to be, it used to host where in the past, when uh, some certain uh, military, military uh, former military head of state or certain uh, military leaders in Nigeria, we are seen as the, uh, what we like to call them, uh, the apex of uh, those that determine what happens. Yes, those then, uh, in the 70s and the 80s, yes, when, when they come together, they decide who is going to be the president of Nigeria, irrespective of how we vote that person will become the president. But the, the current dynamics of politics, voting, uh, coupled with the uh, clincher, the beavers that we have now, I doubt if anybody can totally influence it. People are afraid now to be able to vote, and I'm sure that their vote is going to count. So whether, yes, it's a moral bo uh, poster for anybody that gets such endorsement. If not, why is it that they see that all the presidential candidates visit um, IBB in, uh, in MENA, uh, all of them, I say practically all the major ones, Atiku, Metinubu, uh, Obi, all of them visited the IBB. If it doesn't have any level of influence, then they wouldn't have visited them. They also visited Abu Salam, Abu Bakr, and some visited uh, Obasanjo, former head of state. And at a point, you could see that everybody was shuffling to have the endorsement of Good Lord Jonathan, both the APC and uh, the PDP as well. It has some level of influence, but whether that in itself can determine the outcome of the election in 22, definitely I can tell you that it will not. It's only the Nigerians that will determine that. And that is why the candidates to go out and canvass and tell Nigerians what they can do for them so that they can be able to uh, look at their programs, manifestos, and be able to determine who they think is best for them in 2023. Okay, so on the Daily Sun newspaper, the Independent National Electoral Commission, that's INEC, has said that underage voters and parents of all ineligible voters will be arrested for aiding and abating electoral fraud in the 2023 general elections. I mean, is this not an anomaly that we're talking well, about underage voters? To me, for me, INEC is just passing the book. Who registered the uh, underage voters? Was it not INEC officials? So you are talking that you are saying that people should their parents will be arrested. Where were they when they were registered? They didn't they see that they were underage? So that to me doesn't make any sense. If you are going to uh, solve a problem, you solve it from the root. You you, you uproot the root consistently over the years since 1999. There have been underage voting, especially in the northern part of Africa, and that has been consistent with uh, political leaders in the north, especially and INEC, the governance with INEC officials. When these children go to register, why didn't you stop them from registering? You see children as uh, as old as 10 years, 9 years, 11 years, um, um, getting registered. And on the day of election, you see them finding out in their thousands and millions to vote, especially in the north. Now you are coming to say that uh, anybody that is caught, the parents, how are you going to do that? What capacity do you have? What political ways do you have to do that? What they should be doing is making sure that these children are not registered and so that they will stop them. The INEC in itself said it some time ago that they don't have the capacity to, to stop these children from being registered. So, why are you not coming at and saying? I think it's just lip service, um, INEC. They know what to do and when they're ready for that, they'll do that. Now, uh, another interesting conversation still on the, the Daily Sun is the fact that the Lagos State Police Command has transferred all personnel at the Aja Police Station, uh, you know, following the death of two Nigerians triggered happy police officers and so do, do you think that this solves the problem of police brutality and happy trigger killers 
in the Yoruba prayers, there is something you call lakma lakma. I don't know. Let's see if you understand. What does it mean? I'd like to. Yes, lakma lakma. What is it called? That anyway, that's it. It's kind of um, that uh, dandruff, uh, yes, yeah, sort of dandruff on the head. And you see that uh, somebody is having a headache and uh, somebody is trying to provide solution for Lakpa Lakpa. That doesn't solve the problem. The, um, the transfer of enlistment um, from that station to other stations will not solve the problem. The issue is that even if they transfer, when they go and pollute the other people in other police stations, we have a, we need a holistic solution to this problem of consistent killings um, of Nigerians by the Nigerian police until we do the need by making sure that most of these perpetrators and most of these policemen who are trigger happy to snuff out the life of Nigerians at every single opportunity are dealt with. And when I say that dealt with, that they are taken to court and properly given the necessary sanction by being sentenced. If they are sentenced to death, if they run out to the appeal, they will be hanged. Um, that is it. Uh, they'll be executed. I, I'm, I'm a graduate of law. I, I know very much about law when it comes to issues like this. And I know that across the globe, the issue of um, uh, capital punishment uh, has been abolished and then been abolished and been canvassed by the fact that the way and manner our security agents and some of our uh, some criminals in our society go about it. It's, but that is not only the police also, even those that into criminality and killing, the bandits, the kidnappers, and the rest of them. We have to start testing this. But if you go to our uh, correctional centers of prison and see the number of people that have been sentenced to death that are just um, feeding up Nigeria, you'd be shocked. Some kill their wives, some kill their husbands, some kill children, some rape their rape people to death. Just yesterday alone now, you've seen the report. We are some criminal uh, undesirable elements, keep four policemen in the convoy of the former governor of Imo State, or Hakim. Um, I just had again, and there was a killing in the part of Anambra yesterday, where the president, president general of the town union was also assassinated. When you got, when we police do their job and get our security agencies do their job, let the people arrested, take, take them to court, and they're sentenced to death. Our governors are so delivering they continue to be dialing in on let to on to make sure that most of these people are, are brought to book and make you face the consequences of their action. We will continue to have this even in the United States where you are talking about democracy and human rights. People are being put on the on the electric chairs. There are some states in the United States, irrespective of what about the constitution or what the advocacy in certain quarters, those states go for capital punishment. And if you are um, if you are given a, a, a capital, you, you are sentenced to death, and you exhort all you exhort all your all the avenues for you to appeal. You get executed. So that is part of it. whether that will solve the problem. It affects until we continue to make sure that most of these uh, people behind this, uh, and that also goes back to our recruitment system. How do we recruit our policemen? Who are the people that we recruit? Just recently, a few days ago, another ten thousand uh, new policemen were added into the force. What level of um, uh, exercise did they go? Did you take due diligence to recruit them? Part of the recruitment exercise for me would have been making sure that um, uh, traditional rulers in the various villages are part of the nomination system. That we know those that are of character, of good character, not police, uh, a police, uh, 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 the police that just wayward and people that have no job. Most of the people you see. Taking up police job are frustrated people who have practically nothing to do and no other option. Not because they love the job, but because they're just looking for an end to a means. And when you get them recruited in the system, it becomes an issue. And periodic training is also very key. Uh, those are the issues. That mere transfer of uh, this thing for me you know, wouldn't solve it, the problem. Let's, um, you know, we probably might just coast down uh, with this one. It's about the fact that you have the National Assembly allocating for 2023 $850 million for constitution amend the amendment process that has failed. I mean, it's something that's been going on. Uh, that's on the punch, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, another has been allocated. Let's not forget that over the years, one billion naira has been allocated. And since 2011, 
if I'm not also mistaken, this has been continuing. I mean, this has been ongoing. So, I mean, at what point do we get to a point where we review our constitution and stop all of this waste of resources? Yes, I, mean, I, agree, I agree with you to a large extent. I am the school of thought that what we need is a total review of the constitution, not just a, a, a constitution review in piecemeal. Um, uh, that is for me. And would have gotten that right at the last uh, constitutional conference that we had under the good Lord Jonathan, where so many uh, resolutions we have passed. And um, if we have taken, that would have been a giant leap for us. But this government, when it came, refused to uh, endorse that because they, as an opposition party, then they were not part of the, uh, that process. Um, reviewing the constitution in piecemeal, reviewing the constitution the way it is, um, the 1999 constitution has amended. Um, the process of reviewing that constitution is very, very difficult. If the National Assembly on its own part um, reviews certain sections of the constitution and the 36 states of the Houses of Assembly, uh, to third of that, refuse to endorse that uh, part, that then it becomes a problem. And that is the issue we have now. You know that there are some certain reviews, some sections of the constitution where it's uh, reviewed and passed on to the state Houses of Assembly. Most of those state Houses of Assembly have refused to has that, and if you don't get to third of the states, houses of assembly, and doesn't do those amendments, then it is good as as good as not doing anything. So, and part of those amendments includes autonomy of local government, judiciary, and the rest of them. And you know how the governors are so um, they are adverse to that the autonomy of um, the local government, which they have seen as their own cash cow, because every revenue coming from the federal force goes that goes to the local governments. The, the governors hijack that and um, dispense as they like. So that's the part of the issue as it were. So but I am of the school of thought that we should have a much more holistic uh, um, overview of that constitution that was handed up. They say we, the people of Nigeria, that was the opening of that 1999 constitution, that who are the we? They were just few generals in the army, that um, the military uh, with one or two civilians came together and wrote the constitution and passed it to us. Until we have a constitution that is of Nigeria by Nigerians, then we'll continue to go around this uh, vicious circle. So um, don't forget, the problem also is that once the, this National Assembly goes, they have to start all over again. They can, the next National Assembly cannot even continue from where they stop. And that has always been part of the problem. Any of the bills um, that was not concluded, uh, that is not concluded by this current uh, uh, National Assembly, to start the circle all over again. That the last one is the fact that even when they are passed, another problem is when will the president assent to it? At times, you just have most of these bills and laws passed by the National Assembly. When it gets to the table of the president, he has refused to sign them. So those are the part of the system we are looking at, and we are, that's why we continue to advocate for the position of power, so that also the state in this, uh, on their own can have certain powers over certain issues, especially when we talk about uh, uh, resources resource control and the rest of them, that will help us a lot. There's at least we are that's the going on with your circle as it were. And um, it, no matter how much the people to budget at the end of it all, I know we can get the necessary amendment as to that. Well, so, I, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, issue, especially when we have to every other, you know, budget circle allocate a certain amount uh, for the process that, you know, never gets to see the light of day. And then we continue, just like you have mentioned. So if we have the Ninth Assembly, that's already been budgeted for because they already know that they can't live up to expectation. Is there really a will, um, you know, to ever review the Constitution or even amend the Constitution as it has been mounted and been put in papers? Is there really a will as a people? I mean, when we say a people, we know that um, it's not just limited to you and I, but you have the political gladiators who occupy, you know, offices at different points, whether they are lawmakers or be it, you know, you know, governors and what have you. Is there really a will to do to yeah, review this constitution? I think to some extent, uh, to me, there is some will, but in fact, don't forget also that, forget the fact that they are also interest. They are interest. And uh, where the interests run contrary to the interests of some of the people in uh, our political leaders, it becomes a problem. And also, those are the National Assembly. So, um, if it does, don't, it, it remember what happened with the Electoral Act when it was amended. There are a lot of issues uh, that we had the issue of delegates, the issue of those that are going to. You remember that the foreign that came with that amendment, it caused a lot of uh, problems. Now, 
I personally would have thought that basic issues that concern Nigeria we are not taken into consideration by this current amendment uh, led by the uh, deputy uh, president of um, of the of the Senate, Omo Agege. Uh, look at the issue of state police. If we have gotten that right, then we wouldn't have been where we are today. Even most of the governors uh, agree to that. But the National Assembly looked the other way. They did not talk about the issue of uh, state policy. That for them is just, they were looking at those that concern them, those that have a direct, uh, and then, which is why uh, uh, some of the state houses of assembly seem to have um, grown, uh, grew, uh, grew um, cold feet on this matter. There are some political, there is political will, but the fact is that can they see this true? Uh, most of them um, at the National Assembly, who are our representatives, look at this amendment from two perspectives. One, the political parties they support, and secondly, where they are geopolitical, where they are coming from. There is a lot of uh, furore between the um, senators from the south and the north on most issues um, on the table. And until they remove themselves from looking at themselves as I am from the south and I am from the uh, north, and from seeing themselves as being a part of the ruling party and opposition, they were not going to get uh, anywhere. Self personal and self interest should be uh, jettisoned for national good and national good. That it should be our their responsibilities. That should be what they, they should be more nationalistic in their in their outlook rather than being personalized or seeing themselves as either Igbo, Yoruba, Osa, Kanuri, Ijo, or whatever. Or until they be able to see themselves as Nigerians and working for the same for the same uh, purpose and unity. Then they can can you can rest assured that nothing will come at all. That um, those amendments. Those are the issues as we are. And but I will only say as I will say we can have a total review of that constitution. I don't know how we're going to go about it, whether we get certain people to you know, either elected, purpose, uh, elected, constituted, assembly, or whatever, what a holistic rather than a peaceful uh, look at that constitution. But let's also so, remember so, that um, every, even the advanced countries that have lived over 200 years are also amended the United States. So, I, I mean, um, should we not, uh, just like you have mentioned, that we probably might have, you know, political will, but there's also a case of interest. And how can we, you know, arrest and address this issue of interest? Can it be also addressed by the law? Should there be, you know, a legal framework to all of this where you, we can actually, you know, get it out? Because it, it feels like we will continue this whole um, you know, cry of saying we're going to amend the constitution or we're going to, you know, have a constitutional review and never have it. I mean, uh, vividly you have made reference to the Jonathan's administration of 2014, to be very precise, uh, the CONFAP. And it wasn't implemented because, uh, you know, you have interest saying uh, a lot of persons were not represented, which, if you look at it critically, wasn't really the case. So how do we address the issue of interest and with the constitutional review? Let's say um, in the court, uh, what we call a, 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 in the judiciary, that's what we call um, judicial interpretations. Um, most often than not, the, uh, the court or the judiciary has no right um, of amending constitution. They don't have that right. It's the, making laws is the exclusive right of the legislature. That is why we have three arms of government, executive, judiciary, and legislative arm. Executive is to execute those laws. The judi um, judiciary is to interpret them, and legislature to make the law. They cannot. That power of legislation cannot be taken over by the judiciary. All they can do is interpretation, which is why we are saying that where there is a dispute, as we have currently uh, in most of the, the ones of the, about the tribunal, the legal and the rest of them, that is where the judiciary. 99.9% .9 of those laws, if not 100%, are mostly made by the legislative arm. And they are the only ones that are uh, constitutionally approved, um, given the mandate to make laws. So they can, they are the ones that can make, and where there's a conflict, then the judiciary will come in and interpret. No, no but um, interpret I think, Chris, I'm approved. not sure you got my question. I'm not saying that, you know, the judiciary should be involved or intervene, or that's not the consideration. I'm saying, can we actually, you know, get to a point where we say, 
if you get a certain assembly coming, if you start a process, then it is mandatory that you have to com complete it. Of course, that's also another making of law. Somebody has to make that law. It probably has to be an executive order. Something just to check the excesses of, you know, the lawmakers. That's, that's, yeah, that's what uh, I'm looking yeah, at. Yeah, yes, we can. But you have to know the front. You have to know how lawmaking, um, uh, how, how lawmaking. Say, for example, you know, there's a time in, in our political life that um, uh, the issue of election petition, uh, election tribunals and elections that it took so long it could take the life of a group of a, a government four years for one to be going to court to just to get by the mandate but through the amendment we were able to say that a time frame was there was a cap on the number of days that an election um, petition can go through from the tribunal to the supreme court and also even those that are coming uh, with those petition have a time frame to file their petitions. If that time lapses, you cannot file again. So look, we're able to bring that to play. But when it comes to lawmaking, it goes beyond that because you have to know the processes. One, when a law either has come, it comes as an executive, uh, as an executive, uh, ad, or yes, uh, comes from the executive or from the NGOs or whatever. The issue remains that there are some processes that you go through. First, second, third reading, um, going into uh, where you have to invite people to come and make their uh, you, what to call hearing and the rest of them. And I've also told you that, yes, um, we, we also have a situation where even once they list the National Assembly of the State Houses of Assembly, it becomes a problem because no time, no cap, um, we didn't have a cap as to when um, this process can go through at the State House. Of the only issue, the only issue we have, as far as the Constitution is concerned, that if that bill is transmitted to the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and he was not able to sign that, he has a time frame to which he can be able to sign. If he doesn't um, as, um, sign that um, that uh, uh, amendment or that bill, I was passing the okay. law. Chris, Chris we have to go now. He can be returned to the National Assembly for them. But I totally agree that we can put a cap to it. But whether we can be able to do that, um, is what I don't understand. But right. we need a serious amendment, and if not, to uh, right. look at the constitution. There are so many things um, within that constitution that is not working. And this, we that have is to where go. We are, where are we at today? All right, Chris, thank you so much. Uh, the thing is, we'll definitely continue to talk about these issues until, you know, we get to a point where we can actually be proud of our democracy as a country. Thank you so much, Chris Kane and Wanda, for being with us. We thank, appreciate you. Thank you very much, and I will wish you a beautiful 2023, and same to all our viewers at the place. Have right. a wonderful week. Uh, you too. Uh, that's it. We take a break and when we return, we'll be looking at, you know, some concerns, very is uh, serious issues, especially with the education sector, a tendency that we probably might just have a drift where uh, our teachers would be moving away from Nigeria. If that's the case, where does that leave us as a people? And of course, uh, the issue of the brain drain for doctors is still ongoing. Please stay with us as we come back. <laughs>